Los, ellos, los Chile Bolívares han hecho un esfuerzo eh, descomunal en hacer una presentación que les resulte coherente a todos, ¿sí? Pero recuerden que aquí hay programas graduados en cuatro facultades diferentes, ¿ok? En disciplinas bien diversas y que incluso a veces en una misma disciplina, dependiendo de con quién usted trabaje, la expectativa para un cierto proyecto va a ser diferente. Entonces, eh, ellos tienen una presentación general aplicable a la mayoría de los casos. De todos modos, al final tenemos un ejercicio de discusión quizás más eh, discipline specific, como dirían en inglés, que entonces ahí se hará más fácil hacer las preguntas específicas a la gente de, de, de las ciencias naturales, a la gente de las ingenierías, y si tenemos a alguien de las ciencias sociales, que son el grupo más pequeño acá, pues eso aparte, ¿no? Pero que entiendan que pues, en, en un universo tan diverso como los programas graduados de aquí, ellos han hecho un esfuerzo en hacer una presentación que más bien apliqué pues, a la inmensa mayoría, pero hablaba, habrá variaciones disciplinarias. ¿Eso se entiende? Ok. Adelante. Bueno, buenos días de nuevo. Mi nombre es Jan, de Ciencias Marinas. Antes de empezar, les quiero decir que si ven algo que no entienden o tienen una pregunta, por favor, la haganla. If you have any questions, any doubts about the presentation, please do ask, porque a lo mejor después se nos olvida. Well, the work talk, what we want to do with this workshop is we want to help you graduate students understand the pre-writing and then the actual writing process and the stages that we have within these two processes and how to do it successfully. Because we do have a pre-writing process where we have to brainstorm, we have to, do, uh, we have to plan, and then we have the actual writing process where we do drafts, where we revise, and where we actually do the writing. <clears throat> We're going to provide some guidelines that will help most, most disciplines, the so general guidelines to help with the structure, the drafting, and the, and the manuscripts. And also we want you guys to feel confident at the end that you can, that you can actually tackle this project successfully. And so the, what we plan to do today is we're going to talk about what's the purpose of a thesis, why do we do this, what are the requirements, so, some requirements that we have when, we, when we're writing the thesis, and this, this goes for uh, when we do animal testing or when we do interviews, things like this. What's the basic structure, the actual structure, an introduction, an abstract, table of contents, that type of thing. Uh, and we want to give you also some strategies on how to brainstorm, on how to tackle um, writer's block, that type of thing. <clears throat> And at the end, like Justin said, we're going to divide by major disciplines. I'll, I'll take science, uh, Lisa Engineering, etc. with the arts, and we can have discussions about the actual formatting of these major disciplines or any specific things. <clears throat> and so when, when you get to the master thesis, you do a lot of work, you do a lot of investigation, and all that work is nothing if you don't write it down. And so that's what's really important about your thesis. It's all that information written down and published so that others can see this, read this, improve upon it, use it as a guideline for themselves. <clears throat> it presents original research. So you can't do a thesis on something that's already been done. You can have a thesis that builds upon another thesis. Like it's common in engineering. Lisa had told me that if you, there's a, there's a technique and then you apply this technique to something novel. But it always, have to, it always has to be new information. That's the point of a thesis. It's going to present original and critical <coughs> analysis. And, and of course, you want, to, you want to close the knowledge gaps. You want to find new information. This is what you want to do when you do a master's. And throughout the thesis, you want to plan, complete, interpret, and report. And, and that's, the, that's the major thing about the thesis. You want to report and publish this information. And so. <clears throat> It's very common practice to do a proposal. At, you have to do a proposal, but it's very common practice to build upon this proposal. So if you, you have like a 15-page proposal, it's not going to waste. You can use this as a draft for your thesis. And, and it's very common practice. You already have an introduction. You already have methods. You already have objectives, hypotheses. The only thing you're not supposed to have in your proposal is the results or the conclusion. And that's what, what's going to be added on your thesis. Uh, there's some good 
uh, we have a good reference at the end of the presentation. It's a, a lengthy PDF on how to write good proposals, and then you can access that later on. But usually what we want from a proposal, if you haven't started your thesis yet, is at least 15 pages of good information, and this includes the title page, which is page one, a table of contents, and your references, which in a, a good proposal, it should be at least two, three pages. And the more references you have, good references and good citations, the, the more trustworthy your work, work will be. <clears throat> and so when we do uh, our thesis, we want to keep a, a format. And la UPR is kind of, we, we don't have an actual format that's strict. So each department, each specific uh, discipline will have a different format. <clears throat> we do have recommendations and we put that in bold because it's not obligatory. And you can find that at the OGS page, the Office of Graduate Studies. And this is the link that you can follow later on. But what they do ask is that the, the main text, the bulk of your thesis is on Arial, the Times New Roman, 11 or 12 font. And this is very common. This is what we usually write and publish with. Uh, 1.5 to double spacing, so it's easy to read. Italics for or italics for scientific names and foreign languages, and this is common practice. You want you always want the titles and subtitles to be bigger. That's the way you organize information. You can do that one to two points bigger than your original font, and you want them in bold as well. Then the footnotes, the tables, and the figure captions should be smaller because this is like. Uh, uh, additional information and so you want that eight or nine in single space so it occupies a smaller space <clears throat> you also want your page to look nice and clean and the way we do this is with margins one inch margins all the way and the tables must be within the margin and this this keeps a nice uh, symmetric look on your on your thesis we always want page numbers but we we don't put numbers on the title page but it is number one, the page number one, and the, the preliminary pages, which is the title, abstract, table of contents, that's all Roman numerals. And this is the, the actual PDF for these templates. And it's very important, since I mentioned everything changes, that you always consult your advisor on what he wants and what's the final outlook of the project. But if it's anything like the actual, like the, the recommendations that we have, it should look something like this, where you have margins all the way, titles and, and, uh, and, and subtitles should be in bold and bigger. In these case, they wrote it all caps lock, that's optional. Your name, where you study, what program, department, and all the members of your committee, it should all be included there. And so sometimes when we do our research, before we start writing, we have to get some permits. Anybody that works with animals or anybody that works with human beings has to have this in mind. Uh, anybody that works with human subjects in particular has to fill out the IRB permits and do some, do some, some courses in CV. And this information you can type in Google, uh, UPRM. CP or UPRM IRB, and you can find it where the link is there. Also, if you are going to be testing animals or anything that's a natural resource in Puerto Rico, you do need a permit from the natural uh, from the Department of Natural Resources of Puerto Rico. Sometimes the department, at least in my case, in in marine sciences, we already have the permit that's ongoing, and so I don't have to worry about this every time I go out testing. So I don't have to worry about this when I do my thesis. I just go out and, and test. But many other departments, this can change. Anybody here who expects that they will be working with human beings? Okay, pues para ese soul soul que va a trabajar con eso. Ah, ahí es. Pero ya te lo hiciste. Yeah. Eh, ese link lo lleva a los formularios, pero quizás conviene, me lo escribí aquí, que también esa página está migrando. 
sí. Y una información está disponible en la página vieja y otra en la página nueva. Como a veces nos pasa que no lo encontramos y uno se pone como un poco nervioso. Eh, te, doy, te voy a dictar una sigla, ok, que la notes porque hay, el grueso de la información todavía está en la página vieja y la puedes encontrar en un Google Search bajo CPSHI. CPSHI Room. Eso es Comité para la Protección de Seres Humanos en la Investigación. CPSHI Room. Ahora mismo hay una información ahí y la otra el, en el enlace de acá para que no se pierdan. Sorry, ya. No, te quería preguntar, tam, bajo esa categoría que hay también las entrevistas y cosas Todo que se Todo lo que vuelva a ser es humano, entre, y hasta cuestionarios, ¿sí? Por eso pregunté lo de SIDA, porque a veces mandan por carter unos cuestionarios de si no le gusta comer aquello o lo otro. Entonces, se supone que hasta para eso el investigador haya sacado permiso de la autorización, perdón, del de Comité para la Protección de Seres Humanos, ¿okay? que es como, como el, el, el comité institucional que aprueba la investigación con seres humanos en nuestro recinto. Sí, joven. Estos documentos se los entrega al Departamento de Educación si vamos a trabajar con la escuela pública. Mira, yo quizás ese puede responder a lo de a la escuela. Yo te puedo responder a lo del comité rapidito para no quitarles el tiempo, ¿ok? Lo del Comité para la Protección de Seres Humanos es con la universidad, ¿ok? Y la universidad tiene que certificar, esto tendrá en nuestro recinto a, a 8 o 10 años, no es que ya lo llevamos haciendo hace tanto tiempo, pero la universidad tiene que certificar y protegerse a sí misma que todo investigador, estudiante o profesor que trabaja con seres humanos ha tenido como que este clearance, ¿no? Eso es para con la universidad tú vas a necesitar otra autorización para que te permitan el acceso a la escuela. Confieso que yo no soy la experta, etcétera. So, en ese caso, si es para el Departamento de Educación, tú primero tienes que ir a la escuela y hablar con el director para, pues se supone que esa persona escribe una carta de autorización para tú hacer tu investigación. Después de eso, tú tienes que ir por el Departamento de Educación y que ellos te den otra carta más. Después de que tengas esa carta, tú mandas todo eso junto con tu IRB para que ellos aprueben de que sí tienes clearance para hacer investigaciones para una escuela. Y eso te va a tomar tres semestres. No, no, no. Eso ha cambiado y ahora es más fácil. En, hace un par de años era bien complicado. Es que usted coge el examen ese en línea. ¿Cómo es que se llama el examen ese? El de ah, la IRB que hay es, que coger. Yo sé que es de Social Human Behavior. Sí, son, que usted son coge un examencito en línea y entonces en el formulario interactivo de IRB entra la evidencia que le, que le envían un correo electrónico de ese examen. ¿Y eso sí? ¿Y eso sí? Sí, sí, sí. Sí, Sorry, ya, gracias. Seguimos. Ese es el link y eh, también vale decir, como mencionó Luisa, que algunas veces la permisología puede ser un poco tediosa. <risa> el, y es la realidad. Es la realidad. <coughs> and then once you, once you complete your thesis writing <coughs> and you are about to <coughs> turn it into the, el repositorio, the thesis repositorio, you're going to have to first run it through turn it in. And this is to check for academic integrity. We have a new rule. It's authenticate. Now we, now we have two softwares okay. at the university. Authenticate. So now it's called authenticate. Mm -hmm. And Turnitin will be only for words per class. And then authenticate everything that has to do with research. So if you go into the library page, you can find this information under um, a lead guide called academic integrity. And then you will see the two. So for your thesis, you want the identity, not anymore the, the Turnitin one. Okay, gracias. <clears throat> and we're also going to do another workshop. One of the future, one of the workshops planned for this semester will be Luisa in uh, in in citing in academic writing. So that's really important as well. Okay. It's also very important to check the deadlines for your thesis for submitting thesis and because. Deadlines, as you know, in the OPR calendar, change it, change all the time. So it's it's good to stay on top of that. And we were going to explain how to do the Turnitin thing. 
Oh, I want to go more. So you go to the eCourses page, Biblioteca tab, hit the Turn It In on Biblioteca General, and that'll take you here to check. And that should be it. Drag and drop or add files. So it's pretty, pretty simple. <clears throat> and this is, of course, to check if there's any plagiarism, anything like this. <clears throat> and so now that you know those uh, main things, the, the thesis writing process generally goes with, the, with this format, where you have an introduction, a literature review, methods, results, conclusion, and discussion. And these can change. You can have, instead of methods, you can have materials. You can have, instead of a conclusion, you can just have a, a, a discussion section. They, they, they go, they, they can change. But the idea is pretty much the same, where you have to state a purpose, state a hypothesis. You have to show what's been done, and that you understand, and that you know what you're doing. Where you uh, show that how you're going to do this with precision, because it's important to, to write this well. Once you have your results, only results, not, not your discussion. And results will also be analyses, statistical analyses, or uh, like Edsel has interviews. They have uh, results from those interviews. They add them here. It's not only just numbers, it can be uh, different things. And then at the end, you would have a conclusion where you say, why is this important? OK, so uh, following on what Jan said about the thesis structure, OK? We usually have the preliminaries, and we already talked about that. So the title page, table of contents, if we have a glossary of terms, and the abstract. Okay, after that, uh, and the, uh, remember, these are just guidelines, okay? There's not a set structure for chapters and our chapter names. Okay, you can write uh, whatever chapters you want. It can be six, seven chapters. Uh, but the important thing is that they're organized, okay? So that, that's what we're trying to give you, like, some organization while you're writing uh, your document. Okay, so chapter one usually includes an introduction, okay, and a background. And you should include the purpose of your thesis and, and how to justify uh, the study that's being done. Okay, so chapter two is a little review. We're going to talk a little bit uh, more about that uh, methodology, okay. And you can have uh, people in the sciences have hypotheses, okay. Uh, in arts, sometimes they have research questions. In, in engineering, tenemos lo que llamamos como objetivo, tenemos como un problema que we have to solve. Okay, so depende de, de, pues, de disciplina. Uh, chapter four, uh, results and discussions, uh, conclusions, recommendations. Uh, this is a basic outline of what a thesis uh, should look like. Okay, so we have an abstract. If you have a copyright uh, page, uh, dedications, acknowledgements, okay. Uh, we already uh, mentioned some of these. Abstract, okay. There's uh, important, there's a lib guide on uh, a workshop that we already gave on abstracts. So you should go out and check that. Uh, if you type in Google uh, GWF Greek, okay, you're going to see a little uh, link that's going to say Clinicas de Redacción. And then you can find the abstract clinics, okay, una, abstract, una, una clinica que duró una hora y media, o sea, que, que hay mucha información. Si usted necesita, ¿verdad? pues ir ahí y buscar información, pues ahí la va a encontrar. Lo que vamos a ver aquí es un solo slide, okay, so it's un resumen, uh, super quick, okay. It's important, and we're doing this clinic because uh, we see the work that people bring in at the appointments, okay? Y, y siempre pues es una confusión, ¿verdad? Porque no sabemos bien pues cómo hacer las referencias, cómo formatear el documento y qué de verdad es lo que tenemos que escribir. Okay, so abstract. Abstract es qué? Es un solo párrafo. Y ahí llegan tesis que son tres párrafos, cinco, cinco páginas. Y mira, un abstract es un solo párrafo, okay? It should be well developed, well written, okay? Debe tener que, it should include everything you did in your thesis, pero es super concise. It should have an introduction, okay? Debe de hablar cuál es el propósito, methods, and it should include your uh, results and conclusions, okay? And this is a descriptive abstract, which is the one we do in sciences and engineering, okay? Si ven la presentación, there are many different types of abstract that we can do, pero este es el más común. It should be brief, and these are the ABCs of uh, abstract writing. So it should be brief, okay? There is a concise language, okay? And it, this is important, okay? It should stand alone as a unit of information. Cuando usted escribe un abstract and you're going to submit it to a, a paper, so you, got, you want to publish peer-reviewed, eh, debe estar toda la información referente a su paper o a su tesis. ¿Y, y qué es una tesis en realidad? Es un paper bien largo, 
¿Ok? So, es el mismo formato. O sea, esto lo puede dar a usted para hacer papers, para hacer sus tesis. Eh, debe ser eh, standalone de Security of Information. Debe estar todo contenido ahí. ¿Ok? Todas las partes de su, de su eh, reporte, de su eh, artículo o de su tesis. Eh, no debe tener, ¿verdad? Este, personal narrative. ¿Ok? It shouldn't have your opinion or, or anything like that. You shouldn't eh, include commentaries. It should not have what? Figures or graphs. It's just text. ¿Ok? Y esto es importante, it should be clear. Lo más importante aquí es que no tenga citations, ¿ok? Hay mucha gente que pone los citations en el abstract y el abstract no incluye ningún tipo de citations, ¿ok? So this is uh, the, the most important part of the abstract. It shouldn't include any acronyms, ¿ok? If you're going to include an acronym, you have to spell it out. Uh, es importante saber que la parte de introducción y purpose del abstract se escribe, ¿qué? En present tense, ¿ok? Cuando hablamos de methods y, y conclusiones, pues ya, ya se puede escribir en past tense, que esos son muchos problemas que tenemos aquí, ¿verdad? Viene un estudiante con el capítulo de metodología completo. Todo escrito en futuro. Y ya una vez que usted realiza su trabajo, su experimento, esa metodología va en pasado. Que okay, usted sentarse en capítulo, página por página, cambiar lo que lo es, es tedioso. So it's important that you guys uh, get uh, how you should write every, every part of your thesis, uh, like the right way from the beginning, so you don't have to like, go back and change it. Um, Introduction, ¿ok? It should have what? Purpose of your, of your, uh. Tenemos, ¿verdad? Y nos pasa mucho que vienen estudiantes y no tienen ni idea. Tal vez, maybe they don't even uh, understand the topic that they're working on. Y eso pasa mucho, ¿ok? Usted tiene que tener claro cuál es el propósito de su estudio, qué es lo que usted va a hacer, ¿ok? ¿Cuál es esa hipótesis, esa research questions that you want to tackle, ¿ok? That's, that's super important, ¿ok? Uh, you should include any definitions, ¿ok? Remember that in this, like, interdisciplinary world, todo el mundo está leyendo las tesis de otras disciplinas, so it's, it's a good practice for you to include any definitions of any terms that some other people might find difficult to understand. Okay, we should include uh, delimitations, limitations and assumptions, and this is really important, okay? Uh, you should include, if, if there's something that, that you were able to control, see hay variables that are out of your control, okay, or if there's some information that you uh, assumed during your work. Uh, the introduction is always uh, written in the present tense. Lead review, okay? We also have another presentation on lead reviews. We also give a workshop on that. Uh, so you can find it. We can, uh, when we finish, we can just Google it so you can find it. Uh, this, uh, the, more, the most important part of the lead review is what? That you don't start writing right, bef right when you get your, your problem statement, right after you start uh, you're working on your project idea. The least thing you can do is start writing your review, okay? Because then it's going to need a lot of rewriting, okay? The first thing you do is what? The purpose of the, of the lead review is to show what? That you thoroughly understand your topic, okay? Si usted todavía no entiende bien su tema, usted tiene que hablar con su advisor, you need to get like some background information, okay? Usted tiene que hacer ese search para usted poder entender qué es lo que usted está haciendo, okay? It should be what? It should give either have a coherent account of what you're doing or have a historical background. Okay, dependiendo del tema que usted vaya a tocar, obviamente, este, usted necesita ese background histórico de lo que se ha hecho en su área and what needs to be done, okay? que entonces esa es su contribución a la, a la ciencia. Okay? Usted debe proveer las técnicas, las técnicas disponibles y mostrar que hay un gap, un knowledge gap. What's, what Jan said, that is an original contribution. Okay? So that's, that's how you plan your, your thesis uh, document. Okay? Original contribution, again. La LEDU, uh, the verb tense, depends on the sources you're citing, okay? So it, it, it can be a little tricky. So the first step, si, y sé que hay muchos de que son de primer año, si usted todavía ¿verdad? está como que empezando, lo primero es usted puede hacer búsqueda de las fuentes que usted necesita, okay? Esos son keywords. If you don't know what you're looking for, you're not going to find it, okay? So, y la, y tenemos ¿verdad? un montón de bibliotecarias excelentes, You can come, you make an appointment, and they can give you hints on, on searching techniques, okay? So you can find the papers that you're looking for. Uh, it's good to use uh, bibliographic data management, okay? Como Sotero, como Mendeley, este, cualquier otro tipo de programa que lo ayude. Si usted escribe un reporte de una clase, usted tiene cinco fuentes, pues ah, no importa. Pero una vez que usted empieza a escribir su tesis y tenga 50, 100, 200 referencias, trust me, it's going to make a difference, okay? So, desde ahora que están empezando, plan out, este, tomar algún taller, lo dan en la biblioteca, un taller de, de estos software, de, de, de usted puede organizar sus fuentes, sus citas. 
you need to find uh, good sources, que son la tertiary, secondary, and primary, okay? These usually are books, uh, journals, and research papers, okay? Y es bueno que, que las fuentes obviamente sean recientes, eh, que no sean papers que sean demasiado viejo, y que sean papers que tengan a lot of citations, okay? You don't want a paper that has two or three citations, you want papers that are como que son como que la eminencia, ¿verdad? Son lo más importante en su, en su campo de, de estudio. En Lead Review separamos esta fuente, la información que sacamos de la fuente, we separate them into different subheadings, ¿ok? Y esta parte es súper tricky. Eh, ustedes pueden hacer cita, vienen, podemos discutir. Usually some people that come, come in, uh, they just have like a bunch of different subheadings y pues venimos y nos sentamos y las acomodamos, ¿ok? Y eso pues no, no se puede hacer. Don't get discouraged porque se puede hacer. Una vez que sacamos esos headings, pues vamos entonces a separar la información. Usualmente es bueno usar un synthesis matrix, Ok, y vamos a ir a esta. This is, this is what's a synthesis matrix. Ok, y esto es de, de ya que está allí. Ok, y usted lo que hace, y es bastante complicado, ok, usted se va a Excel y pone, pues mira, tengo estos papers, estos son mis autores, hago un análisis de, de, esa, de, esa, de ese source, eh, puedo escribir cuál fue el objetivo de ese paper, del estudio que se hizo, el año, que es importante, obviamente, si es algo más reciente. Ok, y usted entonces organiza todas sus fuentes por su tema, por su título. Okay. Y eso pues lo va a ayudar entonces a... Sí, dale. Ahí también está bien chévere porque después puede hacer hasta un análisis estadístico con los, los keywords que tenga o técnicas que hayan ahí y ver cuáles son las modalidades. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Eso también está chévere. Ok, so una vez que usted tiene ese matrix y usted eh, lee todos sus papers, ¿usted qué tiene que volver a hacer? Releer, ¿ok? Y esto es bien importante. Hay gente que lee un paper y dice, Ay, yo no entendí nada y no lo quiero volver a leer. Y, y, y es malo porque entonces uno pierde la oportunidad de poder eh, tener un insight. Después que uno sigue, mire, usted lee papers eh, en su segundo o tercer año que usted leyó el primer año y usted va a ver que usted, obviamente su conocimiento va a ir aumentando mientras usted va estudiando, ¿ok? Que, que es importante releer. Usted va a hacer nuevos insights, usted va a encontrar nueva información que no encontró la primera vez. Después que usted haga eso, usted entonces empieza a escribir su lead review. Okay. Why? Because if you start writing from the beginning, y después usted encuentra, ¿qué pasa? No sé si a usted le ha pasado de la paisa, le dice, mira, encontré este paper nuevo que salió esta semana. Y usted tiene que incorporar ese paper en el review. Y usted tiene que ver dónde es que son caja y si tiene que poner la fuente, tiene que moverla, la, ¿ok? Se, se complica. O sea, usted trata de hacer todo su, su estudio, con, encontrar todas sus fuentes, y después que usted tenga todo eso, entonces usted escribe. Es mejor eh, escribir al final que reescribir cada vez que usted quiera incorporar alguna fuente. ¿Alguna pregunta hasta aquí? ¿Sí? Eh, no hay ninguna fuente. O sea, no, no hay ningún número específico. Obviamente, the more the better. Eso es verdad lo que se dice, pero igual, que sean fuentes que sean confiables. ¿okay? Hay mucha gente que lo veo que un montón de páginas de internet. Okay, y a veces es mejor, mira, buscar un libro, buscar un paper, que, que son fuentes más confiables, ¿ok? Este, pero ponle un ejemplo, 100, dependiendo de la tesis, 100, 150, por ahí. Les recomiendo a todo el mundo, ¿verdad? Que ustedes están, you're starting out, ok, búsquense de su departamento, hablen con su advisor, dicen, yo quiero que tú me digas cuál fue la mejor tesis que te han hecho, o sea, cuál es la mejor tesis que, que ese advisor lo ha presentado. Y usted bájela, usted búsquela, y usted sabe tesis, aunque no sea de su mismo tema, pero usted la tiene de guía. Y okay, usted dice, mira, pues tiene tantas páginas, tiene tantas citas, ¿ok? Y eso lo, pues, lo va a ayudar un montón porque tienen pues, un modelo donde, donde guiarse. Y usualmente, que también buena práctica, like reading one or more thesis done in your same department, and preferably one that your chair has already graduated. Those are the thesis you should look at and look at that example, like how many sources they did, which methodologies they use, what does your share like in the writing of their students. That should be something you should think about when you're starting to write your thesis project. Eso, sí. Entonces, en metodología, materials, ok, tenemos que, ¿qué? si trabajamos, como ya dijimos, con subjects, seres humanos, con animales, eh, tenemos que describir todo ese proceso, how we select them, cómo, cómo se hizo todo el proceso. If you have any instruments, ok, you need to write down in the parts of methodology, dónde lo compraron, qué tipo de instrumento, qué tipo de data mide, cuáles son las unidades, ok, that's, that's very important uh, information. And also, uh, if it's reliable and it's valid, okay? Usually people will just write the instrument y es bueno escribir, mira, esta es el, la calibración del instrumento, si está calibrado, cuál es el rango de medición que, que me va a dar ese instrumento. Uh, por ejemplo, procedures, okay? Y esto es importante, because the methodology part is going to give anyone, okay? 
the ability, you should give anyone the ability to replicate your experiment, ¿ok? Tiene que estar ahí todo lo que usted usó, todas las medidas que usted tomó para que cualquiera pueda replicar ese experimento, ¿ok? Y eso es algo que, que, que no pasa, ¿ok? Tú con una tesis de aquí y tú tratas de está incompleta, ¿ok? So, debe estar la descripción mejor posible para que cualquier persona pueda replicar ese experimento. Y como digo ya, si tenemos un eh, análisis de datos estadísticos, eso también tenemos que incluirlo, ¿ok? Tenemos que específicamente poder... Um, cómo esa data refleja en, en la hipótesis que estamos tratando de resolver y, y o las preguntas, el research questions, research questions y los objetivos que tenemos que lograr. Uh, it's written in the past tense, ¿ok? Si estamos escribiendo una proposal, ¿en qué verb tense se escribiría la metodología? En un proposal. Sí, ¿Qué pasa en la propuesta? No hemos hecho, we haven't done our uh, experiment yet. So, debe estar en futuro. Ok, when you write your proposal, the methodology section should be in, in the future. Se va a realizar tal cosa, ok? Sí, porque no lo hemos hecho. En la tesis, it should be in the past tense, because you already did it. Ok? Uh, results, okay, and, and this is important. You should present your results in the same order that you presented your hypothesis or your research questions. Hay gente que, que escribe, ¿verdad? Un orden de objetivos y como tú vienes al results, pues, está como que fuera de orden y es difícil porque uno puede seguir the train of thought. Uh, if, if you're using descriptive data, it should be there, okay? And if you're using any statistical testing, it's, it's important, okay, to, to just... Uh, give the, the methods that you use, si usaron un anomo base, si usaron cualquier tipo de método estadístico, ¿ok? Eh, eh, poder probar que, pues, cómo ese, ese análisis aporta a su, aporta a su, a su documento. O se debe escribir también en el past tense, en la propuesta, no tenemos resultados, obviously, pero we can write uh, something that's called anticipated outcomes. Some professors might ask you to do that, ¿ok? So keep that in mind if you're starting to write your proposal. <coughs> Es importante, estos últimos capítulos, uh, you might think that it's really obvious information, okay, but when you're writing, it's not going to be as obvious. Y, y viene gente con un capítulo de metodología y tengo una tabla de datos en la metodología, okay, porque pues es difícil uno poder separar esto, estos diferentes pues, cosas de investigación que estamos haciendo, separarlo, ¿verdad? En conclusión, esto es resultado, okay. So you should really pay attention to what you're doing, and I've seen like, discussions and conclusions in the results uh, cap, cap chapter, okay? So it's something that you should be aware of, okay? Porque igual, o sea, después que usted escribió, me parece que su profesor, ¿verdad? No sé el caso de mucha gente aquí, uh, your professor's not gonna go through a, a draft with you like every week. Okay, the professor's gonna say, tráeme la tesis tal día, y la tesis está completa. Y una vez que usted termina ya, ¿verdad? Del trabajo que usted pasa para escribir un documento, tiene que volver a reescribir porque usted incluyó resultados en la conclusión o, o escribió discusión en la metodología, pues se complica. ¿Okay? Y podemos tener muchos casos. Así que vayan pensando eso, ¿ves? estar consciente de how do I separate what's conclusion, what's a discussion, and what's, what are my results. Okay, so we need a summary of findings. Uh, and this is important, okay? The conclusion sh should be drawn by your results. Es lo que usted, lo que usted, el resultado que le dio su investigación. Sometimes there's conclusions que no tienen nada que ver con, con lo que se investigó y son pues más como que your personal opinion or your personal experience, ¿ok? Y eso pues no debe tomar parte, ¿verdad? De, de, de la investigación. They should uh, only be drawn by your results and nothing else. And, and for the research, ¿ok? This is really important because most people don't include it, ¿ok? Y es importante que usted sepa cuáles son las limitaciones de su, de su estudio, ¿ok? Todos los estudios van a tener limitaciones. Y es importante usted poder en su misma tesis escribir, mira, estas son las limitaciones que tiene y esto pudiese ser like future research, okay? This could be expanded upon and we could do X o Y este experimento para poder entonces mejorar. Okay. Acuérdese que usted, o sea, su tema, ¿verdad? Usted se lo da a su profesor y usted no, no se espera que usted como que, ok, usted resuelva todo el problema de, del ambiente, resuelva cualquier, o sea, ¿eh? es un proyecto de investigación que usted lo va a hacer en dos años, ok? Y siempre va a haber cosas que, que, van, a, que van a faltar hacer. Y eso es importante que usted lo escriba ahí. Uh, this, uh, this is the link, okay, it's from the University of, creo que es Kansas, okay, I think it's from the University of Kansas. It's the, the, the most complete resource that we can find, okay, so if you have a QR code, you can scan it, okay, and it's a 30-page document on how to format your uh, thesis, okay. Obviamente, nos basamos, ¿verdad?, en ese documento para hacer la presentación, pero pues ahí lo van a tener completo, y it's really helpful, okay, le explica 
cada una de las partes, le explica cómo formatear su propuesta. O sea que, que es, un, es un link bastante es, es bien útil. Okay, these are different guidelines, okay, and, and format tips from uh, Rice University. ¿Alguna pregunta hasta aquí? Eso es todo, yo me voy a usar. Okay, everyone. Well, if I didn't mention myself, I'm Etzel Sintron from the English Department. We're going to be talking about not only the manual styles, but also some strategies to be that writer's block that sometimes is the main source of problem when we're trying to write big projects such as papers for publication, our thesis project, and others. Before we get to that, let's talk about a little bit about the manual styles. Here right now at the Greek, we do have sources available. If you have to write your prize, your research project in MLA format, APA format, Chicago style, or any other, those resources, you can find them here and borrow them as long as you're here at the Greek. They're located there at the common circle right at the back. There's a little table over there in the corner, if you can see like all the books over there. We provide all the manual styles, both in English and Spanish, depending on what language you're required to write your big project. And of course, with our lit guides at the university, we have a lit style for APA format. We do have useful link for Chicago style and for MLA, depending what are your needs and resources in each of these manual styles. All right, let's talk about strategies and tips for long-term writing projects. So I'm gonna start off with a few questions. So when you start writing, and when you want to write, like, let's say, maybe a paper publication or one essay for a class or a lab report, how often you look at your big word screen empty, you're ready to write, you know what you're going to do, three hours later, you still have that same empty word screen in that computer. How many has that happened to you? O cuando ha pasado por eso, tal vez. Don't be shy. I mean, me ha pasado a mí también, don't be shy. I can see you like naughty, like, yeah, yeah, I don't want to do that. All right. How many of you think that, oh, let me take a quick 30 minute cat nap, but those 30 minutes turn into two or three hours of napping time and you completely lost all your productivity time when writing your project? I mean, I love to take naps and that happens to me a lot. <laughs> and the first time I went to my first, fee, uh, to my chair for my first thesis meeting, she quickly asked me like, what are your problems with distraction? And I told her all of that. So the first thing she told me is that, okay, I need you to read this book by the next meeting. If not, I'm not going to share you. So basically, she got me books that helped me how to be writer's block and how to strategically plan my thesis process throughout the whole period. Two books I'm going to talk about quickly is The Clockwork Muse, that basically it's a guide that shows you strategies of how to handle big projects in the long term. And the second one, which is How to Write a Lot, this one focuses more on publications and papers, specifically if you want to publish a lot and write a lot in a short amount of time. But these are two good resources that actually teaches you a few techniques of how you can beat or conquer your own writer's block and how you can increase your own productivity time. So for the purpose of this workshop, I'm just going to mention a few recommended by these resources. The first thing the book does talk about is how to send yourself as a writer like what kind of writer are you, but most importantly, when can you actually write a lot in a short amount of time? One of the things the book recommends is your own writing schedule, but it's not simply putting your agenda, I will write in this hour every day and that's it. It's more about understanding yourself and what time of day can you write? And what space or environment do you need to be able to produce those ideas, those ideas and write? So for example, in the author's case of the Clockwork Muse, currently the author talks about his experience in graduate school while being both a, a doctoral graduate student and a parent and dealing with those two heavy workloads. Basically, they have given an example that every day they will wake up from 4 to 6 a.m. to write just on a dissertation and work on that every day. So basically, you will have to think of yourself, what is the best time that my brain actually pops and works my best ideas? Is it during the morning? Is it after a morning jog? If any of you exercise, I don't, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> um, is it after lunch? I mean, after lunch doesn't work for me because I get sleepy, but <laughs> for some people it works. All right, so when you think of timetables, another thing you have to consider when organizing your schedule is not only when is the key time for you to write, but how many pages or how much work are you willing to put in weekly or daily? In the offer suggestion, they will suggest that, for example, for chapter one, let's say we're writing a proposal or in the thesis, I'll dedicate two pages a day as a minimum. 
Obviously, you can write more, but that's depending on how much you think yourself you can produce within a day or within your own time limit. When we talk about spaces, you have to think, do I work better if I'm alone? Do I work better if I'm with peers? If I have someone like constantly like pressuring me to give me the projects or do I work well with deadlines? Like when I say deadlines, I don't mean like five hours before your thesis meeting to magically write something to your chair and hope that he or she will approve it. I mean that strategically each day focus on that project to give a good finished piece. Because again, with both your proposal and your thesis project, you can't write anything that's half finished or anything that looks like it's incomplete. You have to give your all every time for your progress and your project to move. Because one of the first things they're going to tell you when you begin your thesis is that this project, it depends 100% on you and you're the one that takes over it, okay? When we talk about too distracting or inspiring, sometimes you might have to think of ways to make that space more vivid and your environment to be more calming for you to be able to write in peace. Like for example, some people use aromatherapy in their environment, they light up scenting candles. Some people find it more comforting like working on coffee places and using all the noise as a distraction, like if it was white noise for example. In my case, I can't wear coffee because the noise distracts me too much. I prefer to listen to white noise on YouTube, like the sound of rainfall, fireworks, or anything that could like distract me and help me focus on my writing. So there are many techniques that you can try out and experience that helps you mold your productivity time within your writing of your project. Now, and after you understand that, you're actually going to understand how that motivates you and yourself to actually finish your project and completely success a huge project like a publication or your thesis project or your abstract or anything you have to turn in in a few moments. The book recommends that there are three times to engage in writing. Like when it says the clockwork muse, it's not that the muse is going to appear magically and spontaneously. It's more that you're creating the muse by the way you progress with your time. So the author recommends three different productivity times that you always do at all times. What he mentions as A time is basically your highest point. That's the moment where you sit down and you actually wrote something useful in the two hours you said you're going to write in. So basically, your A time is basically all the writing you're going to do for that period of time. B time is your second productivity time, but when you think of B time, you're actually going to do productive tasks that are going to help you build up your A time, such as reading other articles you're going to use for your literature review, for example. Um, as data that you're going to develop your chapter 4 or create your tables, but at all times you're actually working on your thesis. You're not working on something else as a separate project, you're working on the same thing. And that's the thing you have to remember when you categorize each of your productivity times. C time will be the lowest one, but in C time, I will say that for example, sometimes you will tell yourself, oh I'm bored, I don't know what to do, and you're standing there with a blank screen not doing anything. When in your C time, you can do other stuff related to your thesis, like, for example, creating your acknowledgement page, creating your title page, doing the structure of your thesis. And I have to say, the structure is the biggest thing that most students struggle with, especially when you turn to format, law, um, legal size tables, or different figures within your documents, or the different formulas that you have to incorporate when you're writing. You don't want to leave that for the last minute before turning into OGS. You want to do that with time or with precise. So you save yourself from a future headache from these problems. When you talk about time matters is that within your whole research project and your whole progress within your writing, you actually have to think about ways to make your life easier, not your life harder within the writing process. So one thing that was recommended is that your for those who are not too tech savvy with your computers or using any writing programs, it will be a good advantage to learn any short keys or anything in advantage that will help you speed up your progress. Using apps that will actually help you motivate within your writing will also help, like having the document read your chapter for you. Like if you're, for most part, if you're done reading your own chapter, you don't see any errors, but then if someone else reads it for you or your computer, and then you notice that, oh, I'm missing something in the contact, that's practically something that's useful within the writing as well. Because again, you'll notice things that you yourself are a twain, and then your share person doesn't have to waste their time like correcting the obvious things. Now, when we talk about key and what, how the book progresses of the clockwork and managing your time, it's not a good thing to practice all these short keys in one single day. 
Because I know some people like to get it over with in practice, but then in the long run, they probably forget which keys would. So the same way that you will progress and pace yourself when you're writing your chapters, like two a day, you're going to do the same practice of practicing a few shortcuts that are going to reduce your hassle and increase more your productivity time. And when it says learn to work with format, again, the thing we talked about earlier, not only your writing style, but also the structure of the whole project. When we talk about save your progress, and this is one of the most stressful things that most of us suffer from, because we would like to think that a computer that we spend like $600 on will last like our whole master's degree or three years, but in reality, technology is getting more updated, which means that old technology is getting more downgraded. And everything you save isn't there, but then one that you just lost it all. Again, you don't want to suffer those future headaches when you're progressing in such a long project like your thesis or even your own proposal. So you always have to make a second plan to always save your work constantly. In my case, I use both. Well, I have, since I have such a problem keeping up with tabs and I really want my work to be saved all the time in case anything happens, because I'm using PenDrive, I always use my Google Drive for most of my chapters a copy of that in Dropbox, and also creating my own Gmail specifically for my thesis project, having my name. And every time I finish a chapter or collect data or do something, I just send it to myself within that specific email. So you're basically saving yourself copies in case anything happens, you have it all there in one place. Well, in this case, multiple places. And if you're one of the many ones that are in Colegio, but this is just a suggestion of how you will write your name within your Gmail. Because if you just write one thesis, but it's going to say name already taken, pick another one. So again, if you have a very common name, be creative with your username. That way you know it's yours and you know where to send it all the time. In terms of the other book of how to write a lot, it does recommend a good quote where it says, writers who complain about writer's block are writers who don't have an outline. Even though this will take you back to probably your first year or freshman English courses where your instructors would say write an outline and you're like, I don't want to, that's a waste of time. But lots of more higher education folks do recommend an outline just because you want to have a constant memory or constant focus of what you want to talk about during your huge project. Outline is one of the best things you can do, but instead of just writing a simple outline like, this is my topic sentence, this is my thesis statement, this is my objective statement. You're gonna ask yourself more critical thinking questions of how you want your project to be molded for the intended audience. Like for example, how long does your paper need to be? You always have to think about like what's necessary within the length of how you're gonna produce it, who's gonna be your audience, and not only general public, you have to think about it, more specifically, are other professors going to read your paper? Is it only for you to share? Are you going to share this in a future conference with other scholars? So you do have to pick and knit what you're writing about because it all depends on how you're going to formulate it and the language use of it, of it all. Um, how much attention do you want to give to your previous research? So this will tell you more of what Luisa talked about in literature review, like how much and how recent your sources have to be. You always have to think of that. And then when you want to complete your outline, you always have to consult what in your own writing and the procedure of it as well. And I know this is the biggest part where people are like, I don't want to do this. I already wrote it. Let's just submit it. But again, in order for your writing and your own ability as writers to be improved, you do have to revise and edit your projects a lot before submitting the final version. As we talked about before, here at the Greek, we do offer services to practically look at your chapters and projects. It's a free service as long as you reserve us at the Greek. You don't have to pay anything for it. And as long as it's in English, you can solicit this. Um, and you're a student. Yes, very important. So you can sneak in none of your undergraduate friends or anything like that. <laughs> this is strictly for graduate faculty and researchers, as Ilda just mentioned. All right. Basically, that's all that we have for today's project. These are just a few references that we included throughout the whole thing. Before we end the workshop, we're going to show you a few things that we mentioned at the beginning of the workshop. If Lisa can come up a little bit. All right. 
Sí, pueden, pueden jugar con so, la... for most of you, first years or practically starting getting acquainted with the Greek services, we are going to talk about how you can solicit these services and how you can take most advantage of the facilities. So, first of all, you're going to go to the Greek's main website, but specifically, you're going to look for GWF, which is the Graduate Writing Facilitators. In our little tab, there are a few resources that you can use. The first one being how to our services. Um, and there's a little tab where it says that you can access our previous workshops that we've done for the past years. So from 2016 to 2018, we do have workshops available that you can access, like postal precision for sciences, academic writing for STEM, grammar review, and so forth. All of these are accessed through PDF format, so you can just click on them and download them, and these are for you to use and to revise as you continue your graduate studies. All right, let's go on how to reserve the services. So you have two options. Either you can, if you have a specific graduate writing facilitator in mind and want to work with just that person, you can just go under their image and click select appointment. They're going to give you the availability of date and time they have. And after that, you just select them, fill in your basic information, such as your name, last name, email, and then your, your appointment should be scheduled to be announced for that day. The system is supposed to automatically remind you a few hours before that you do have an appointment for that day. So unless you forgot to write it down or mark it in your Google calendars, the system will remind you, okay? If you want a random graduate writing facilitator, as in you don't care who it is, there is a button up here. Oh, there used to be a button up there where it said. We used to have a button, but then somebody, yeah, uh, not him, but we had a problem with the system and it didn't uh, like Jan, so we, it, it would never appear. So, so we eliminated. Now you have to go to each of the boxes. Okay. But again, just so you know how our services work, per week you are allowed to reserve. For example, if it's the same person, if it's John, you're allowed to reserve it twice a week, maximum two hours for each session. Um, if you do want to plan your projects accordingly, you might want to reserve like one at each GWF if you want to get a lot done during the week. But I remember, we don't see each other all the time, so you do have to tell the next person, oh, with this person, we work with chapter two, and this is what we did. So that way the other person can know how to help you the most efficient way, okay? Yes, if it's just the first time you're serving the services, you do have to fill out a form that Lisa will show us in a few minutes. But basically, the form is just to let us know what kind of project you're bringing us, what specific help do you need, and how, and basically the outcome. We ask this for statistical purposes, but also to prepare ourselves to help you with the best of our abilities. All right, so with this display and everything, we conclude today's workshop. We're going to open the floor for questions. Y, y algo importante, the email, please, email me button. Eso no, esos emails no le llegan a nadie, así que por favor. Email esto. Sí, exacto. Exacto. O si nos ven por ahí, pues confianza, piden el email, ok, pueden escribir. So instead of giving you like a boring activity, so we just wanted to, uh, Wait, uh, get your feedback, okay, if you have any questions about what we talked about, uh, if you're working on something specific and you want to talk to each, any one of us. Yes, yeah, so if any of the science majors want to talk to John about anything specific, you can now. The same for engineering for Lisa, and if anyone from arts is here, I guess only two people. If you have any questions for me, you can. Before you leave, very important, please fill in the survey so we can get feedback about the workshop. So either you can use your iPhone or a free key barcode if you have Android to scan it through the barcode. If you don't, grab your tablets or laptops and just write uprm.lipsurveys.com tiger. The password will be 2018. Our name should be here at the bottom as it's John Dominic, as you can draw, and Lisa Feliciano. And this is the title of the workshop, Mapping Your Thesis.